working here. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, hi, I'm David Alsop, uh, and I've been working for the last couple of years at Camel Labs in Cambridge. Um, if you haven't already come across any of the work I do, I tend to be a bit mad about trying to get anything on Camel's work on Windows. <laughs> and unusually, I'm actually a Windows user as well as a Windows programmer. So, um, I thought it would be interesting to go through some of the things in the last few years that have, have sort of bitterness when converting various tools, both in on Camel and in platform related tools, and see whether there are any lessons that can be learned for writing your own applications in the future. So, is it working? Excellent. <laughs> so, I think my major thesis is that Windows is not, in fact, a distribution of Unix. There's quite a lot in OCaml that tries to make it look like it. The OS integration library is called Unix. Um, <laughs> there are, we have to use a system called Sigwin in order to provide Unix utilities even to build OCaml. I pose the idea that this is maybe not the way we should be thinking about it, that we should be trying to move away from this for applications that we want to call truly cross-platform. Um, and in order to facilitate that, I thought I'd give a little tasting menu of war stories <laughs> along the way and hopefully some lessons that can be learned from it. So we'll look at bits in the process model, um, text files, console I, and things like it's just there. So, dive in. The process model, I expect you're very familiar with the Unix one. So Unix provides a primitive called fork, takes an existing process and duplicates it to a new process, and the return value of the system call allows your code to tell which one's which. Critically, on top of that, it also provides a primitive called exec that allows you to load a new piece of code into one of those processes and then carry on with that completely new code image. On the Windows side, you are expected to create a process. Inside the kernel is a primitive called PSP allocate process. It is the only way in Windows that you create a new process. It allocates a new executive process object rather than cloning an existing one. So critically, I tend to think the fact that Windows doesn't support fork is the, is the take home most people know. The more critical one is the fact it doesn't actually support exec. There is no equivalent after you've started a process easily to load a new code. Um, how, do, how does that come up with mattering? Well, if you look in our Camel's Unix library, you will see that the exec for family of calls are all there, um, and they all supposedly work, because the Microsoft C runtime does actually provide uh, a call that looks and tastes like exec, but isn't quite right. So if we consider this fairly easy Camel program, I think on the Unix side it should be reasonably obvious. If you call this program with one argument, it's going to tell you what its PID is, exec itself with no argument, and the exec version should wait for a second, and then tell you what its PID is again, and everything should terminate. I don't know if anybody would like to guess what that actually does on Windows. So here is a Windows PC for anyone who's not seen one before. <laughs> so if we compile this program and we then run it, we get the PID. Oh, back to the shell R. Another one later. There's the PID again. Not quite the result I think we were expecting. So what happened? The code for exec for is exactly the same between Windows and Unix. There's nothing in the OCaml code that's different. It called the underlying C library. Uh, what is different is that Microsoft lied. There is no exec for it. It's an emulation that goes on. It's based on the underlying create process call. And actually, rather than doing anything that looks like a Unix exec, it created a new process and killed the existing one. So what happens at that point is your bit changes. You are, in fact, a new process. And that's not ignoring the fact that Unix.getPid doesn't actually work on Windows. And critically, the original process terminated, which meant that if you were waiting on the termination of that process, you will then have been signaled that the process is terminated. And even the Windows shell doesn't understand that and returns to the prompt early, and you just end up with a console disaster afterwards. Um, how did that affect us? Uh, our camel test didn't like this. In fact, when it was testing the Unix.exec for functions, um, it's a very confusing bug to track down because sometimes it looks like things work. It's a, it's a concurrency bug, effectively. Um, it affected our Haskell as well a couple of years before it, it did us. Fixing it is actually quite tricky. Um, it's not possible to fix the exec for call. Um, it's fundamentally just not a concept that works on Windows. So there's nothing we can actually do about it. You have to use a slightly more complex uh, mechanism on Windows to detect whether the children processes have finished. So what do I think proper abstractions? I think spawn. So have to accept Windows doesn't have fork and exec, don't use it if you want to be cross-platform. Come up with something based on spawn that works on both platforms. 
mine then. Mm. This is a personal favorite. <laughs> if you've never heard of this before, on Windows, a text file, the lines end with a character turn and a line feed, and on Unix, they end with a line feed. We could end it just there, but it turns out we can't. Um, <laughs> the reason for anyone who cares is to do with the heritage of the operating systems. Um, Windows is based on CPM, which was a very small operating system that preceded DOS. And because it was very small, it assumed direct access to the terminal, and so for the teleprinter required that you wrote both characters just in case to ensure the teleprinter was at the start of the line and then went on to a new line. Unix, of course, inherits the great Multix operating system, and Multix added complexity wherever it possibly could and assumed <laughs> there would be a terminal driver set between the, um, your printf statement and the actual output. Uh, I can't remember the command, Stephen will tell me. I think if you run STTY raw on a modern Linux system, you can tell it to behave with the CPM way even to this day. Internally, Unix is still doing that translation for you when you write just a line for you. Why do we care? Well, there are various ones. The famous one is that Windows Notepad cares. Um, and it has done for a very long time. And I happen to have a mildly old C to get to it. A mildly old computer to hand. It's working. Oh, no. <laughs> Don't <laughs> the demo. It's, <laughs> it's Windows 95 all over again. <laughs> Alas, Windows has let me down. Windows Notepad is unable to display that. If you open a Unix formatted text file, it will just display everything on one massive chunk of text, which is a little bit of a nuisance. Um, what I was trying to show you, though, was that that's been the case since 1985. Next month, Microsoft will finally release the fixed version of Windows Notepad. <laughs> <laughs> Joking to one side, it is kind of irritating when you actually have Windows users. It's, Notepad is a, is a very dumb text application. I, mean, I of course use Vim, um, <laughs> even on Windows. But um, it, there are points where it will start up automatically. It's a, it's a damn nuisance if it displays text files incorrectly. So OK, it's problems just about it, but that's one. Much more importantly, Bash doesn't understand Windows text files. If you have a shell script that's formatted with Windows line endings, it won't even get past the shebang line. At that point, it assumes the slash R is a part of commands. Um, so that's a big problem if you've checked out um, Unix shell scripts on Windows that you're expecting to run in SIGWIN or in um, Ubuntu on Windows in WSL, because um, they won't work at all. Um, the other flip side of it is that another thing that cares is the Windows command processor. It's not just bash, it's CMD cares as well. This um, very interesting looking script, which should just display the single line go to kaboom on, uh, with Windows line endings works just fine. So I have that one just here. That's what it's supposed to do. If I instead translate it to have Unix line endings and run the same script again, you get that very strange error message at the end of it, which is solely down to the Unix line endings. Um, the precise detail of that is that for some reason, there's a buffer inside the command processor, and if your command label happens to span it, then there will be an error passing it inside it. That's the best anybody's come up with with the debug trace. This, this, that's still present in Windows 10. Um, you can fix it by deleting any four characters from the comment, and that's scripted. <laughs> <on Windows. laughs> um, again, joking to one side, it took the Jenkins team three years to trace that bug down, fix it in their continuous integration um, system. So that's another point at which it can matter whether you're writing the correct file. So, challenges, what's the easiest way of fixing it? Well, let's just use OpenIn. It says in the standard library that opens files in text mode. It'll translate it on Windows. We can just pretend there's line endings. That works fine until some really annoying Windows user sends you a Windows text file to your Unix system, at which point nothing works, because your Unix system won't use OpenIn. It won't do any translation of the Windows text file because it doesn't know about it, and you'll have uh, character returns at the end of all the strings that we're looking at. Um, it gets even more subtle when you start dealing with shell scripting. That little command there should be a quite simple test of whether the Unix library is installed on the compiler you're looking at. But on Windows, that won't work. Because on camel minus where it has a new line at the end of it, which means that when it comes out to the console, it has a carriage return at the end. So you have to strip it in order to make that shell script work. <laughs> so despite the fact it seems like a joke topic, it comes up an awful lot where the text file encodings actually matter. Um, and as those examples show, trying to pretend that you could 
just be entirely Unix or entirely Windows. It's very unlikely to work all of the time. The solution, I think, at this point is just to embrace it. You have to support both of them. You have to write a lexer that understands both line endings. You have to work out which text file it was when you opened, just not be quick. Um, and on top of that, I think it's a good idea to test it. You want to be exposing yourself to all of the time. Um, it comes up, there was a Dune bug I fixed recently where it was internal source code and the PPX was generating two carriage returns at the end because of a tiny tweak and breaking the whole section of the test suite. You only spotted it when you were on a Windows checkout of the source code of Dune. You can set that in your CI to have a particular build host that chooses to do a Windows checkout instead of a Unix checkout and see what happens. The Windows console, venerable CMD, DOS, shell, whatever you want to call it, um, it tends to be assumed that it's quite dumb, that it'll just do white text on a black background, and that's basically it. Um, it's actually got quite a lot of support. It has full mouse support, full keyboard support, there are screen buffers, you can do all sorts of fancy views if you want to. What it doesn't do is let you do any of it using escape sequences. At least it didn't. Microsoft, you cuddly Microsoft, have changed all of that. And in Windows 10, you can now opt in to be able to use VT100 escape sequences as you would on Unix. But Windows 7 and 8 is still going to be around for quite a long time, and they don't understand that. So <coughs> so some of this is still relevant. Um, the way Windows does it instead is there's a whole series of API functions that control what the console is going to do. So effectively you set the color of your text before your printf statement and the next time you write. That's what it will do. So far so good, you can wrap those C functions as easily. The problem is what it's then done to your actual OCaml program. So it means that your data and the control for it are now in two separate channels where before they were conveniently as one. So this program I have here I think is a fairly easy, another easy example of how you might deal with a, a status line in a simple console application on Unix. Uh, you print the fact you've got a, uh, something in progress, you flush that to standard output, and then you just leave on the output buffer a carriage return and the delete line instruction, which is the final little bit of it. You do whatever it is you're going to do, and then you just flush a status command and expect that to work. A naive translation of that to, to work on Windows won't work, because it's very difficult to take into account the fact you need the flush and then pausing in the middle before actually writing the next instruction. You, you will end up, in the naive version, you would have written the um, erase line too early. Um, so yes, quick, quick and dirty uses of VT100 won't always work for, for the most part if you're going to be on Windows. The best way to do it is actually to abstract us to stop embedding things in strings. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's to abstract your own API. On top of that, you don't necessarily have to do it yourself. There are libraries out there. Lambda term has native support for the Windows console. I don't think that no TTY is one of the other ones does, but of course contributions, I'm sure, are always welcome to it. <laughs> so that's another area where I think it's easy to win. Um, the shell. Quite easy. If you want to have a simple life, don't ever call out to the shell. If you've ever seen anything about how you escape commands in the Windows command prompt, it'd be quicker just to pretend it doesn't exist. Um, if you do have to call out to the shell, just to make matters more complicated, there are three choices. You can use the Windows native command processor, which is all the weird set of commands that come built in with batch files. You can install a system such as Sigwin that provides a POSIX layer. Or with Windows 10, you can actually install Linux on your Windows system and call into that instead. Each one of those has its own complexities. There's three different sets of escaping rules for how you're going to call it. Um, there's two different ways of how you three different ways of how you encode file names. Um, so that Unix command that you want to call it better be important. Right. So I would argue that portable shell, shell script writing, and by portable I mean actually running on Windows and Unix, not just running on BSD and Linux. Um, writing truly portable shell scripts is at least as hard as the interprocess communication stuff we were talk, I was talking about earlier on. Um, if you're relying on some kind of Unix plumbing command, it'd better be a good one, because all you're doing is moving pain from the application point to the installation point later on and actually getting it to work. Um, but equally, sometimes there's absolutely no choice. You know, a camel, for example, in the MinGW port relies on a C compiler that is a sequin application, so it has absolutely no choice to be able to call that. Um, proper abstraction for that one is kind of tricky, because you start to hit very many other things with the shell quite quickly. Um, you can use a library, um, Daniel Bunsley's BOSS library um, abstracts a lot of OS primitives quite nicely and um, implements them in, in pure or camel or using the Unix library. Um, even that has a sting in the table, in, in the tail, sorry. So suppose you want to erase a directory which may or may not be empty. Simple solution, rm minus rf foo. I'm sure we've all done that before for a temporary directory. 
You can make that work with Sigrid, there's no problem. Or you could use something like BOSS. I can write a command like that. Looks simple, problem solved. Not quite. switch back to my VM. So on here, I have Ubuntu on Windows. I'm going to create a directory there. I'm loading again, I've brought, brought up BOSS. So I'm going to delete that directory using BOSS command. But just before I do it, I'm going to be a nuisance and go back to my other shell prompt and change into that directory before I run it. <laughs> And that's unable to delete the directory. Because while on Unix you can delete a directory that the process has open, on Windows there's no such thing. So in fact, the abstraction at that point, even though you thought you were being very good and you've gone to use a pure camel to do it, the simple fact is you have to you can't rely on the fact you can delete a directory on Windows. You need to come up with a better way of doing it. Having another abstraction. Uh, just Unicode is the last bit whistling through. This, um, this is actually quite a good story. This one is already won. Um, <laughs> so back in the early days of Windows, there was no support for Unicode at all. It was far too old. It was in the 1980s. Um, in the late 1980s, Microsoft started working on Windows NT, which is what we tend to see today. And um, a little bit like IA64, they were trying to pack pretty much every technology they could think of into this operating <coughs> system. Um, at that time, the Unicode standard was a 16-bit encoding called UCS2, which is a, a limited precursor of what's now UTF-16. Um, in order to maintain compatibility, they duplicated any API function that took a string and produced one version that accepted 8-bit character strings and one version that accepted 16-bit character strings. Um, it took us a long time to adopt this in our camel, because it was only in our camel 4.06 last year that we actually released this shortly after ICFP, because it was quite difficult to adapt. How we did that, I think, is quite interesting. So the API functions, as I say, are expecting this 16-bit encoding. Unix is expecting UTF-8 encoding, just because Linux was slightly behind on support, or relatively behind on, to Windows on, on the support. But we need the OCaml API to remain the same between the two. We can't have it that the, the um, signatures are different for the OCaml functions in the standard library, things like OpenIM and so forth. So how did we do this? We came up with a new C-type. We introduced this type charOS which on Unix remains just a normal character, and on Windows gets mapped to that strange wchar underscore d thing, which is the Windows type for Unicode character. We then replaced, um, we added a few utility functions that convert between the two, so you can take an OCaml string in and get a Windows Unicode string back, and you can convert back the other way. And on top of that, we remapped all of the system calls. So we renamed every call to a C standard function, which takes a string, and created our own version called underscore os. And on Unix, they're just aliases. So the functions we expected before, and on Windows, the radio system, the corrected versions that take these 16-bit strings. And the whole thing went through in a, a very large diff in PR10 something in, um, in 4.06. Um, the effect, effect of that was that, for the most part, you just don't notice. The only time you need to worry about that on camera is if you're writing C stops that are going to accept file names, because you need to worry about converting the UTF-8 to the correct UTF-16 call. So in summary, Worry about Windows at the beginning of your program, not at the end. Then the abstractions might actually be correct. A, a good example of this is Duke, which had Windows support right from day one. Um, that, for example, if anybody wonders, is one of the reasons that Dune uses .exe as a default extension when building executables, because that just magically allowed that to work on Windows. Um, if you're going to have an abstraction, it's worth actually abstracting over the correct thing. An awful lot of the abstractions in place are just abstractions over Unix. They haven't given you the correct abstraction over the actual OS primitives that matter for what you're going to do. And finally, continuously test and expose yourself to what it's doing. Find an irritating Windows programmer and try and get them to contribute to your project and see where that gets you. Thank you. For questions? So, oh, I have a question. So sorry. Uh, <laughs> if you say we should spawn and it's wrong to use exec on the Unix library. Mm -hmm. Why haven't you sent a PR to have a spawn in the Unix library? Uh, well, we have, uh, you'd be using Unix.openProcess at that point. So it's using the process API, you know, effectively rather than doing that, which of course then on Unix will actually be done using pork and exec under the hood, which is the correct semantics. Yeah. 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 Y
if, if you're using this every day, uh, what would you say, what's our state as a community on Windows? Can I, if I want somebody to learn OCaml and they don't know anything, mm -hmm. and uh, they use Windows, can I go tell them to learn OCaml? Use uh, it today? I, I would actually encourage you to, at the moment, it's probably quickest if they have Windows 10 to tell them to fire up the um, Ubuntu on Windows prompt. That's the fastest way. There's a, a one fork of, of OCaml, 1.2, that's been going for a while, by a chap called Andreas Hauptmann. Um, which is on um, GitHub, it's OCAM repository from NGW, which is a complete system that gets you OCAM 1.2. Um, I'm in the process of finishing a native Windows port of OCAM 2, which will now bring OCAM 2.1 that, that point. So, so I, soon I say, it should just be OPAM installed. Yes, like, yeah, exactly. And, and hopefully by the end of the year, it would be the case you should be able to download the platform distribution that will be able to work right there. Yes, um, You said you worry about Windows in the beginning. Um, it's hard to get a Windows machine. I mean, it's your kind of um, Do you have any advice on what workflow we could adopt? Yeah, there's, um, so I, uh, in terms of being hard to get it, it depends. If you're lucky enough to be in a university, then chances are you have access to what's Microsoft Connect, so it's actually easier to get a Windows machine than you. I, I know he works at quite a poor company, so I expect it's hard to get help. <laughs> the, the other one that, that's little known is using the Appway continuous integration system. It is possible to configure that so that when your build fails, it allows you to remote desktop into the build slave at the end, which gives you one hour on a Windows computer, <laughs> um, which can be remarkably useful as a, as a poor man's way of doing it. Um, equally, there are systems you have know, Microsoft Azure, for example, can give you a VM relatively to you know, that you're paying for anyway when you spin it up. So there are, it's difficult to come up with three solutions for it, but yeah, it's, it's possible to. I think we should go have some tea. Uh,